Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lulu. Hello, Lulu. Hello. And- Lulu has one announcement, and then we're off into the stories. I love it. Yes. Okay, so just again, a reminder, we talked about this last week, but we are upon the time of the Bad Magic Giving Tree, the fifth annual. So amazing. Love doing this. We fund it with the Patreon donations. That's December's donation. And then we ask our fans, if you have the ability to, to help build that fund so we can help uh, as many families as possible by purchasing Amazon gift cards. And if you are able to do that, you just go online to Amazon, get one of their gift cards. And when it asks who to send it to, enter in the email address, givingtree2023 at badmagicproductions.com. And uh, for those of you who've been asking how you can possibly get some support for your family this holiday season. Sorry, badmagicmerch.com. Nope. Oh no, it's Bad Magic Productions. is going to be up? Um, You are going to send an when you are, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I yeah. messed up. Okay, <laughs> Dan thought I was directing you to a wrong place that doesn't exist yet <laughs> that is forthcoming. No, it's just if you purchase an Amazon gift card where you're sending it to, the email address sorry. that you're going to enter is givingtree2023 at badmagicproductions.com. And then for those of you who are looking for some support for your family this holiday season, we're aiming to help 30 families, but that depends on how much help we get from the fans. And Dan and I will match that dollar for dollar up to $13,000. But if you're looking for help, Tuesday, November 21st at 12 noon Pacific time, you can go to badmagicmerch.com and you can look for the Giving Tree banner and you can click on it and enter your family's information and the first 30 people to get there. It's just the cleanest way to do it. Uh, Those are the 30 people. We will help. And if all of this was too consuming for you to pay attention to and track, if you're driving, you can go to badmagicmerch.com dot com right now and there is a banner there that you can click that will have all of this written out for you and that is the end of the announcements <laughs> that's pretty good i did that's pretty, pretty good fast. that's pretty good even with your interruption i could like i'm watching the clock <laughs> under, under two minutes so how many stories do you have speedy hi hi i have two awesome stories this week uh my first story about a cursed house in saint augustine florida okay cool okay and like a nice big fat juicy story a, a, a very long series of events. We've been to St. Augustine before too on one of my stories. It's been a long time, but yeah. Yeah. And like there's a history of it being a very haunted place. Yeah. Old, old city in the US. Exactly. And then in my second story, we have a personal haunting in India, a a curse placed upon someone. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's really, I enjoy hearing from our international fans. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I like all of you. I'm just saying. Spices it up. Spicing it up. Well, I'm, I'm shifting things up. I have way more than two stories today. Well, how many do you have? A hundred? I have seven. Holy hot damn. Seven small ones. Some are very small. Um, I'm really excited for today's stories. I came across Bouncing Around on the Web, a super cool old book of ghost stories. I ended up buying True Irish Ghost Stories, originally published in Ireland in 1914, and then revised, expanded edition with more stories added in 1926. Uh, The author, John D. Seymour, was an Irish Anglican priest Born in 1880, he published a number of books on theology, and then just two on the paranormal, Irish Witchcraft and Demonology, and True Irish Ghost Stories, uh, before he died in Dublin in 1950. Uh, I was definitely worried that written in the style of the times, the language would be too flowery, and the stories just wouldn't be that scary. Uh, No. Very straightforward stories, and many of them very creepy. For whatever reason, they gave me the chills uh, more than a lot of recent stories. Okay, I love that. Yeah, so you uh, you ready to show what kind of comfy socks you got on this week? I'm so excited about these socks. Look at baby Baphomet. <laughs> Look at those. Come Cute on. little demon guy. I love it. Thank you so much to our fan, Jamie, who uh, sent these in. I appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, after each of these stories, I will have uh, a little glossary just to go over on occasion, you know, some terms that might... They just aren't commonly used anymore. That, okay. I, that I didn't know what they meant. Okay, that's great. Then I can ask you less questions. And the, yes. The chick can be quiet. <laughs> uh, these first four stories are from Dublin. Then there's going to be three that will come from other areas of Ireland. 
Um, I'll read an expert excerpt from the foreword to let John Seymour explain how he came to possess these accounts because I thought this was really cool. It appears he took all of this very, very seriously, which I love. And I love how the tradition we have here on Scared to Death of sharing submitted fan stories of the paranormal has existed for such a long time. Uh, what John did over a century ago in Ireland is basically exactly what we do now with Scared to Death when it comes to sharing fan accounts of the paranormal. Very cool. So here, here is a bit of what he wrote. In accordance with the immortal recipe for making hare soup, H-A-R-E is in a rabbit. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had first to obtain my ghost stories. Where was I to get them from? And I'm guessing that there must have been some common saying about how do you make rabbit soup? Well, the first thing you do is you get a rabbit. Um, for myself, I knew none worth publishing, nor had I ever had any strange, strange experiences. While I feared that my friends and acquaintances were in much the same predicament. Suddenly, a brilliant thought struck me. I wrote out a letter stating exactly what I wanted and what I did not want and requesting the readers of it either to forward me ghost stories or else to put me in the way of getting them. The letter was sent to the principal Irish newspapers on October 27th and published on October 29th and following days. I confess I was a little doubtful as to the result of my experiment and wondered what response the people of Ireland would make to a letter which might place a considerable amount of trouble on their shoulders. My mind was speedily set at rest. On October 30th, the first answers reached me. Within a fortnight, I had sufficient material to make a book. Within a month, I had so much material that I could pick and choose, and more was promised. Some of my readers may cavil at the expression, true ghost stories. For myself, I cannot guarantee the genuineness of a single incident in this book. How could I? As none of them are my own personal experience. This at least I can vouch for, that the majority of the stories were sent to me as first or secondhand experiences by ladies and gentlemen whose statement on an ordinary matter of fact would be accepted without question. And further, in order to prove the bona fides of this book, I make the following offer. The original letters and documents are in my custody at Donahill Rectory, and I am perfectly willing to allow any responsible person to examine them, subject to certain restrictions. These latter obviously being the names of people and places must not be divulged, for I regret to say that in very many instances my correspondents have laid this burden upon me. This is to be the more regretted because the use of blanks or fictitious initials makes a story appear much less convincing than if real names had been employed. So I like that he invited these like, yeah, come check out the original documents. And then last thing before I get into these stories, uh, the book does not feature illustrations, so there won't be pictures after each one. I'll just show at the very end of all of them some cover artwork from various editions throughout the years. Uh, I just love that these stories have endured and that John's book has been published over and over and over since its initial publishing. Some of the terms, again, a bit outdated, or at least ones I'm not familiar with. So yeah, again, I'll have that glossary at the end of each. Here we go. Time now for the tale of the lady of the house. Mrs. G. Kelly, a lady well-known in musical circles in Dublin, sends as her own personal experience the following tale of a most quiet haunting in which the spectral, in which the spectral charwoman does not seem to have entirely laid aside all her mundane habits. Mrs. Kelly writes, my first encounter with a ghost occurred about 20 years ago. On that occasion, I was standing in the kitchen of my house when a woman, whom I was afterwards to see many times, walked down the stairs and into the room. Having heard the footsteps outside, I was not in the least perturbed, but turned to look who it was and found myself looking at a tall, stout, elderly woman wearing a bonnet and old-fashioned mantle. She had gray hair and a benign and amiable expression. We stood gazing at each other while, while one could count to twenty. At first, I was not at all frightened, but gradually, as I stood looking at her, an uncomfortable feeling, increasing to terror, came over me. This caused me to retreat further and further back until I had my back against the wall, and then the apparition slowly faded. This feeling of terror, due perhaps to the unexpectedness of her appearance, always overcame me on the subsequent occasions on which I saw her. These occasions numbered twelve or fifteen, and I have seen her in every room in the house and at every hour of the day during a period of about 10 years. The last time she appeared was 10 years ago. My husband and I had just returned from a concert at which he had been singing, and we sat for some time over supper, talking about the events of the evening. When at last I rose to leave the room and open the dining room door, I found my old lady standing on the mat outside with her head bent towards the door in the attitude of listening. I called out loudly, and my husband rushed to my side. This was the last time I have seen her. 
one peculiarity of the spectral visitant was a strong objection to disorder or untidiness of any kind, or even to an alteration in the general routine of the house. For instance, she showed her disapproval of any stranger coming to sleep by turning the chairs face downwards on the floor in the room they were to occupy. I will remember one of our guests having gone to his room one evening for something he had forgotten, remarking on coming downstairs again, well, you people have an extraordinary manner of arranging your furniture. I have nearly broken my bones over one of the bedroom chairs, which was turned down on the floor. As my husband and I had restored that chair twice already to its proper position during the day, we were not much surprised at his remarks, although we did not enlighten him. The whole family have also been disturbed by a peculiar knocking, which occurred in various rooms in the house, frequently the door or wall, but sometimes on the furniture, quite close to where we had been sitting. This was evidently loud enough to be heard in the next house, for our next door neighbor once asked my husband why he selected such curious hours for hanging his pictures. Another strange and fairly frequent occurrence was the following. I had got a set of skunk furs, which I fancied had an unpleasant odor, as this fur sometimes has. And at night, I used to take it from my wardrobe and lay it on a chair in the drawing room, which was, my, which was next my bedroom. The first time that I did this, on going to the drawing room, I found, to my surprise, my muff in one corner and my stole in another. Not for a moment suspecting a supernatural agent, I asked my servant about it, and she assured me that she had not been in the room that morning. Whereupon I determined to test the matter, which I did by putting in the furs late at night and taking care that I was the first to enter the room in the morning. I invariably found that they, again, had been disturbed. Weird. Mm -hmm. I just love how straightforward the story is. Yeah. Right? And, and how it follows one of the biggest rules of modern hauntings. The spirit does not like having things changed in the uh -huh. home in any way. Yep. Yep. Did the husband see it? Because when she said, I was curious, uh, after the concert mm -hmm. and they were having supper and then she saw the woman standing on the mat, like kind of like listening. Yeah. And then she called for her husband. They don't give any indication. So I'm guessing no. Yeah. But, but it does seem that he was aware of it because her and her husband had restored the chair, restored, moved right. the chair back. So even if he wasn't seeing it, he was definitely believing her. Yeah. Yeah. I would think so because, you know, if it's happening frequently with like the furniture and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm him, I'm kind of paying attention to where my wife is and just yeah. anyone else in the house just to make sure. And, you know, she def definitely didn't mention that, you know, uh, he didn't believe her. Right. There was no indication of that. Yeah. And I wonder why just for 10 years, like 12 or 15 times right. you see this apparition. And then that's it. I want... When that happens, it always makes me wonder, like, is there something that the living person did that yeah. caused the spirit to go? Or does the spirit oh, feel right. satisfied? Right. Or uh, was it just as simple as, like, someone else of that spirit's family, uh, like, calling them home in some way? Like, yeah. d totally unrelated to the house and to the person that is being haunted. Mm -hmm. But was that spirit called to a, a different a different place or put laid yeah. to rest in some way. It, it almost makes uh, the visitations feel more credible to me. Yeah. As opposed to someone just like, you know, it just keeps happening, keep, which I'm sure it can. Sure. But it just makes me think like, oh, if they really had, okay, let's say like a mental illness that was causing them to hallucinate, mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't, it, those, those things don't tend to just go away. Right. And so the fact that there's been 10 years of no sightings makes me believe her a little more about the sightings that she did claim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, then, and then there was a couple words I was not familiar with. Just charwoman is a, is a woman hired to do general cleaning, like a maid. Oh, okay. That's helpful because I so that's thought- That's why she liked the tidiness. Okay. I thought it meant like she was burnt, like I know. charred. Yeah. Yeah. It's a definitely like archaic uh, uh, term and not really used in America. And then stole, you might know. Oh, I know a muffin stole. Okay, so I didn't know those, but a stole is a woman's shoulder scarf or of fur, mm -hmm. marabou silk or other material, and then the muff is an open-ended cylinder of fur or cloth into which hands are placed for warmth. You would know it by sight. You just don't yeah. know it by term. It's like, you know, if you think of, uh, basically it's just a scarf and then like mm -hmm. a thing that women hold uh -huh. across, like, think of it as being like a tube, a tubular yeah. thing with like fur on the outside. You put your hands into it and like hold it here. Yeah. So you would see it like... I think most commonly kids would see it on like Cinderella or like a Disney princess. They're like in their big dress and then they yeah. have this like long shoulder covering scarf kind of thing and then a thing that their hands are in. Okay. You okay. would know it 100% by sight. Yeah, this lady seems fancy. Just the referencing different floors of the house, yeah. servants, mm -hmm. muffin um, stole, muffin her stole furs. going out for, you know, to watch her husband sing at something. I'm like, yeah. th these are uh, aristocrats of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Speaking about her skunk furs that she mm -hmm. has to air out. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, you ready to go to another story set in Dublin? Yeah, this is fun. Time now. Oh, yeah, this one is creepy as shit. Time now for the tale of the priest and the beast. Time now for creepy as shit. 
A truly terrifying sight was witnessed by a clergyman in a schoolhouse a good many years ago. This cleric was curate of a Dublin parish, but resided with his parents some distance out of town in the direction of Malahide. And it not infrequently happened that he had to hold meetings in the evenings. And on such occasions, as his home was so far away, and as the modern convenience of tram cars was not then known, he used to sleep in the schoolroom, a large bare room where the meetings were held. He had made a sleeping apartment for himself by placing a pole across one end of the room, on which he had rigged up two curtains, which, when drawn together, met in the middle. One night, he had been holding some meeting, and when everybody had left, he locked up the empty schoolhouse and went to bed. It was a bright, moonlit night, and every object could be seen perfectly clearly. Scarcely had he got into bed when he became conscious of some invisible presence. Then he saw the curtains agitated at one end, as if hands were grasping them on the outside. In an agony of terror, he watched these hands groping along outside the curtains until they reached the middle. The curtains were then drawn a little apart, and a face peered in. Oh! An awful, evil face with an expression of wickedness and hate upon it which no words could describe. It looked at him for a few moments, then drew back again, and the curtains closed. The clergyman had sufficient courage left to leap out of bed, make a thorough examination of the room, but as he expected, he found no one. He dressed himself as quickly as possible, walked home, and never again slept a night in that schoolroom. I mean, I don't blame him. He's like OG GTFO. Yeah. I like yeah. it. But just that, si just um, the way it's set up, I love that. Such a tiny little story. Oh, yeah, it gives me the chills. I just picture it so clearly. Um, yeah, like uh, it reminds me of like, uh, oh, I kind of had a, a bedroom in a, that wasn't a bedroom in this one house I lived in in college. It was just like, um, kind of like a family room downstairs. Oh, I was thinking about the not bedroom bedroom at your dad's house. Oh, no, 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 no. This is just different where it's like you would go downstairs into the basement where there, you know, was like an open room and then a hallway that actually led to real rooms with doors. Yeah. And I just rented part of that open space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could just walk down and it's like, I would have loved to have had some kind of like um, PVC pipe set up where you just make the curtains uh, rods and like a, like a fake little wall. Mm -hmm. And then, so I was just picturing, you know, a version of that. And I can see it so clearly where you feel, see like what feels like hands moving down from the end to the middle uh -huh. and then pulling them apart and having a face pop in. That is terrifying. What it made me instantly think about was the setup in hospital rooms when you share a room with yes, someone. Yes, yes. Right? And your bed is here and the curtains go completely around on that like track system mm -hmm, uh, in the mm -hmm. ceiling. Yes, yes. And then just like- Totally. Because you can imagine like a nurse coming in, they're trying to find the opening where the curtains spread open. I was thinking about it in terms of a hospital as well. I'm like, that would be such an obvious place for that to happen. Yeah. A haunting because there's so much death there. Yeah. Oh my God. And if you're like the nurse on call, the 15th time your patient is like, but there's something. They're like, oh, all right, let's sedate this one. <laughs> yeah. La la la. La 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 la. The so, curtain, but also it's like very like, you know, Hitchcock, you know, like behind yeah. the shower curtain. Yeah. It's so, I love the history of horror. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, it is, yeah. we've been telling these tales forever. Mm hmm. I know. I, I do love, um, I mean, we'll see if they, you know, work out or, you know, not, but like, um, to get think about history of horror, we have been talking about, you know, like, uh, another researcher as we, as we prepare to kind of freshen things up next year on scared to death and time suck. And she has studied at Trinity college in Dublin. And she just sent an email to us this morning. I was just kind of talking about with her about how Ireland is like a cool place for, you know, for somebody who's interested in ghost stories, which she very much is. Yeah. And she said that from the library at Trinity college, she checked out a horror book, an old one that uh, Bram Stoker had previously checked out. I know, you told me that earlier, and my mind was blown. So, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, I just love the, the the legacy of this kind of stuff, the history where it's like, you know, who knows, you know, with this book, mm -hmm. who it kind of inspired to then either go ghost hunting themselves or go into fictional horror, and then they write a book, and then that person writes a book, and then that person could have influenced Stephen King or any kind of like the modern horror masters, and it just keeps going. I love it. Love it. Uh, two things I didn't know. A curate is a member of the clergy employed to assist a rector, rector or vicar. So basically like the rector is the priest in charge of the parish and this is like the assistant. Okay. I didn't know that term. And then Malahide is now an affluent little coastal town suburb, a 30 minute drive from downtown Dublin, just hmm. north. So we'll stay in Dublin for this next little story. Time now for the tale of the House of Madness. The following tale sent by Mr. E.B. DeLacy 
contains a most extraordinary and unsatisfactory element of mystery. He says, When I was a boy, I lived in the suburbs and used to come in every morning to school in the city. My way lay through a certain street in which stood a very dismal semi-detached house, which I might say was closed up regularly about every six months. I would see new tenants coming to it, and then in a few months it would be to let again. This went on for eight or nine years, and I often wondered what was the reason. On inquiring one day from a friend, I was told that it had the reputation of being haunted. A few years later, I entered business in a certain office, and one day it fell to my lot to have to call on the lady who at that particular period was the tenant of the haunted house. When we had transacted our business, she informed me that she was about to leave. Knowing the reputation of the house and being desirous of investigating a ghost story, I asked her if she would give me the history of the house as far as she knew it, which she very kindly did as follows. About 40 years ago, the house was left by will to a gentleman. He lived in it for a short time when he suddenly went mad and had to be put in an asylum. Upon this, his agents let the house to a lady. Apparently nothing unusual happened for some time, but a few months later, as she went down one morning to a room behind the kitchen, she found the cook hanging by a rope attached to a hook in the ceiling. After the inquest, the lady gave up the house. It was then closed up for some time, but was again advertised to let. And a caretaker, a woman, was put into it. One night about one o'clock, a constable going his rounds heard someone calling for help from the house and found the caretaker on the sill of one of the windows, holding on as best she could. He told her to go in and open the hall door and let him in, but she refused to enter the room again. He forced open the door and succeeded in dragging the woman back inside the room, only to find that she had gone mad. Again, the house was shut up, and again it was let, this time to a lady on a five-year's lease. However, after a few months' residence, she locked it up and went away. One of her friends asking her why she did so, she replied that, or on, on her friends asking her why she did so, she replied that she would rather pay the whole five years rent than to live in it herself or allow anyone else to do so, but would give no other reason. I believe I was the next person to take this house, said the lady who narrated the story to me. I took it about 18 months ago on a three years lease in the hopes of making money by taking in boarders, but I am now giving it up because none of them will stay more than a week or two. They do not give any definite reason as to why they are leaving. They are careful to state that it is not because they have any fault to find with me or my domestic arrangements, but they merely say they do not like the rooms. The rooms themselves are good, spacious, and well-lighted. I have had all classes of professional men. One of the last was a barrister, and he said that he had no fault to find except that he did not like the rooms. I myself do not believe in ghosts, and I have never seen anything strange here or elsewhere, and if I had known the house had the reputation of being haunted, I would have never rented it. So this one, I, I just like that like nobody is willing to say What's what going they on? saw, but several people went mad, one person hanged themselves, another, you know, and, and like person after person after person was just like, I don't want to be here anymore. And I think it was all women that leased the house if I was tracking it correctly yeah and, and then men were basically Staying subletting there. I know but I wonder if that's some like part of it yeah and I don't like, know does the house hate women right yeah what is in there that they're like and I, and I like that the you know the one lady when asked you know was just like you know I just don't want to be there but like refused to give details like I kind of yeah. liked that this in the story that no one was willing to give details because I'm like was it that terrifying mm. that you just don't want to share what you saw or you're afraid of being you know called crazy yeah or for fear that you're going to spread it or make it worse or right you just want to get away from it and not speak about it especially the person who doesn't believe in ghosts uh-huh that person I'm like if you don't want to talk about it it feels like there's something pretty serious <laughs> yeah. going on here the only, the only thing I didn't know I think I think context gives it away but to let I yeah. didn't know was to rent a room or a house to others I knew to let. To let. I don't think anybody really says that anymore. Oh, I do. Yeah? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's my, my favorite term, you know. So yeah. one one more story is set in Dublin before we'll take our, our quick, you know, Mitchell break. A haunted house in Kingstown, County Dublin, was investigated by Professor W. Barrett and Professor Henry Sidgwick. The story is singularly well attested, as one might expect from its being inserted in the pages of the Proceedings SPR. I'll explain what that is later as the apparition was seen on three distinct occasions and by three separate persons who were all personally known to be uh, were all personally known to the above gentleman. The house in which the following occurrences took place is described as being a very old one with unusually thick walls. Time now for the tale of the old woman upstairs. 
the lady first saw her strange visitant in her bedroom. She says, disliking cross lights, I had got into the habit of having the blind of the back window drawn and the shutters closed at night and of leaving the blind raised and the shutters open towards the front, liking to see the trees and sky when I awakened. Opening my eyes now one morning, I saw right before me, this occurred in July of 1873, the figure of a woman stooping down and apparently looking at me. Her head and shoulders were wrapped in a common woolen shawl, her arms were folded, and they were also wrapped as if for warmth in the shawl. I looked at her in my horror and dared not to cry out, lest I might move the awful thing to speech or action. Behind her head, I saw the window in the growing dawn, the looking glass upon the toilet table and the furniture in that part of the room. After what might have been only seconds of the duration of this vision, I cannot judge. She raised herself and went backwards towards the window, stood at the toilet table and gradually vanished. I mean, she grew by degrees transparent and that through the shawl and the gray dress she wore, I saw the white muslin of the table cover again and at last saw that only in the place and at last saw that only in the place where she had stood. The lady lay motionless with terror until the servant came to call her. The only other occupants of the house at that time were her brother and the servant, to neither of whom did she make any mention of the circumstance, fearing that the former would laugh at her and the latter give notice. Exactly a fortnight later, when sitting at breakfast, she noticed that her brother seemed out of sorts and did not eat. On asking him if anything were the matter, he answered, I have had a horrid nightmare. Indeed, it was no nightmare. I saw it early this morning, just as distinctly as I see you. What? she asked. A villainous looking hag, he replied, with her head and arms wrapped in a cloak, stooping over me and looking like this. He got up, folded his arms, put himself in the exact posture of her vision. Whereupon she informed him of what she herself had seen a fortnight previously. About four years later, in the same month, the lady's married sister and two children were alone in the house. The eldest child, a boy of about four or five years, asked for a drink, and his mother went to fetch it, desiring him to remain in the dining room until her return. Coming back, she met the boy, pale and trembling. And on asking why he left the room, he replied, Who is that woman? Who is that woman? Where? she asked. The old woman who went upstairs, he replied. So agitated was he that she took him by the hand and went upstairs to search, but no one was to be found, though he still maintained that a woman went upstairs. A friend of the family subsequently told them that a woman had been killed in the house many years previously, and it, and it was reported to be haunted. Aha! Mm-hmm. Funny that she came, not funny, but it was like, she came back at the exact same time. Yeah. Or the exact same, same month. month. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's just like the month in which she died, and then that's yeah. when... Just three distinct appearances to three separate people uh -huh. who supposedly never talked to each other about this. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that gives it so much validity. Uh -huh. it's not You're not uh, conjuring it up for them. Yeah, yeah. And the proceedings SPR, I thought this was interesting, uh, the proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research is what that oh. stands for. First published in 1882 out of London, the SPR was the first organization of its kind in the world, its stated purpose being to approach these varied problems without prejudice or prepossession of any kind, and in the same spirit of exact and unimpassioned inquiry, which has enabled science to solve so many problems, once not less obscure nor less hotly debated. Uh, its stated purpose was to understand events or is, and abilities commonly described as psychic or paranormal, Quarterly accounts of hard-to-explain phenomena have been published since 1884. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, some old OG ghost hunters. I like it. And then a looking glass is a mirror, but oftentimes made of metal instead of glass, uh, typically uh, a lady's dressing room mirror, mm -hmm. and a toilet table is a vanity. I knew all of that. Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't know those terms. Low table with a mirror or mirrors when someone sits to put on their makeup. Mm -hmm. A toilet table. A toilet table. <laughs> toilet. Uh, do you got any questions? No. Yeah, I think these are pretty straightforward. Uh, we stay in Ireland now, but head to the western coast of the country. Uh, okay, so this next story, yeah, very short. A lady who requests that her name be suppressed relates a strange sight seen by her sister in Galway. Time now for the tale of I Will Drag You to Hell. Oh, dear. The latter's husband was stationed in that town about 17 years ago. One afternoon, he was out, and she was lying on the sofa in the drawing room when suddenly from behind a screen where there was no door came a little old woman with a small shawl over her head and shoulders such as the country women used to wear. She had a most diabolical expression on her face. She seized the lady by the hand and said, I will drag you down to hell where I am. 
The lady sprang up in terror, shook her off, when the horrible creature again now disappeared behind the screen. The house was an old one, and many stories were rife amongst the people about it. The one most to the point being that the apparition of an old woman who was supposed to have been, or supposed to have poisoned someone, used to be seen therein. Needless to say, the lady in question never again sat by herself in the drawing room. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like uh, these old timey people are just smarter than we are. <laughs> I like They're how- not messing around. I like apparently in the early 1900s, uh, late 1800s, they had a real problem in Ireland with ghosts of old women. Well. Such a theme here. Scorned women. <laughs> yeah, I guess We're so. We're coming for you. Uh, okay, so for this next little story, we're going to head back to Ireland's east coast to Drogheda, <laughs> a 45-minute drive uh, north of Dublin. How do you say it? Drogheda. Drogheda. Really- it, is, it is not spelled like that at all. That's how I heard people say it. Uh, two stories are told about haunted houses in Drogheda, the one by, <laughs> I don't know you, how, it's sound, a weird word. You sound so stupid when you say <laughs> I know. Drogheda. Drogheda. It, it almost sounds like you're trying to have an accent that you don't have. No, it's, I don't know, it's a D-R-O-G-H-E-D-A. It's like a Celtic, yeah, those are tricky. Um, so the, yeah, two stories told, the one by A.G. Bradley in Notes on Some Irish Superstitions, published in 1894. Incredible. So even older ghost book. Um, the other by F.G. Lee in Sights and Shadows. No date given as both appear to be placed at the same time. That is 1890. It is quite possible that they refer to one and the same haunting. And we have so treated them accordingly. The reader, if he wishes, can test the matter for himself. (laughs) Time now for the tale of the violent white woman of Drada. This house, which was reputed to be haunted, was let to a tailor and his wife by the owner at the annual rent of 23 pounds. They took possession in due course. But after a very few days, they became aware of the presence of a most unpleasant supernatural lodger. One night, as the tailor and his wife were preparing to retire, they were terrified at seeing the foot of some invisible person kick the candlestick off the table and so quench the candle. Although it was a very dark night and the shutters were closed, excuse me, the man and his wife could see everything in the room just as well as if it were the middle of the day. All at once, a woman entered the room, dressed in white, carrying something in her hand, which she threw with the tailor's wife, striking her with some violence, and then vanished. While this was taking place on the first floor, a most frightful noise was going on overhead in the room where the children and their nurse were sleeping. The father immediately rushed upstairs and found to his horror the floor all torn up, the furniture broken, and worst of all, the children lying senseless and (gasps) naked on the bed and having the appearance of having been severely beaten. Oh my God. As he was leaving the room with the children in his arms, he suddenly remembered that he had not seen the nurse. So he turned back with the intention of bringing her downstairs, but could find her nowhere. The girl, the nurse, half dead with fright (gasps) and very much bruised, had fled to her mother's house where she died in a few days in agony. What? That's it? That's it. Just one crazy encounter downstairs, upstairs, simultaneously, where people were just getting beat to shit in this house. And it sounds like it happened really fast. Really fast. No buildup. Very different than the, than the rhythm of a normal ghost story. There was no like, oh, there we heard some whisperings. Um, you know, like a, a, well, and the an actual ominous attack, presence. The actual attack yep. seems to have been just like- comes out of nowhere. Yes, comes out of nowhere, but like the length of it, like mm-hmm. to be beaten so severely, yeah. what did that happen in a minute? Yeah, sounds like it. That's wild. I know, just, uh, I was like, I, I can't recall hearing a similar story to that. No, and that's very terrifying because there's no way to, like, I don't even want to say prevent, but uh, stop it mid-attack. Right, right. When it happens like that, what, if I hear our kids screaming upstairs, I run upstairs, God. I assume that I'm going to be up there in under 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be able to save them, help them, whatever. If I get up there and Monroe is just beat to shit naked. Right. and the and the room is torn apart. In 30 seconds. Furniture broken, the floor torn up. Especially if I was awake. Like if I was asleep, I would be able to justify mm-hmm. in my brain like, oh man, that must have been going on for a while and I just didn't hear it. I was in such a deep sleep. Yeah, but yeah. they were not. They were wide awake. Yeah. That is very uncomfortable. And, and, I, and I like with a lot of these that there isn't more details. That the people weren't interviewed. They just sent in this letter, a really quick thing, and just let you imagine what may have happened before or afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then the nurse died? <laughs> yeah, a couple days later. Yeah, died oh. a couple days later. Succumbed to the ghost beating. So strange. So bizarre. Okay, so one more. Good, little, I'm sick of your voice. <laughs> a little longer than the others, but still a short story. Time now for the tale of It and Other Castle Ghosts. 
Kilman Castle, in the heart of Ireland, the name is obviously a pseudonym, has been described as perhaps the worst haunted mansion in the British Isles. That it deserves this doubtful recommendation, we cannot say. But at all events, the ordinary reader will be prepared to admit that it contains sufficient ghosts to satisfy the most greedy ghost hunter. <laughs> a couple of months ago, the present writer paid a visit to this castle and was shown all over it one morning by the mistress of the house, who under the nom de plume of Andrew Mary has published novels dealing with Irish life and has also contributed articles of the ghostly phenomena of her house to the occult review in both December of 1908 and January of 1909. The place itself is a grim, gray, bare building. The central portion, in which is the entrance hall, is a square castle of the usual type. It is built on a rock, and a slight batter from base to summit gives an added appearance of strength and solidity. On either side of the castle are more modern wings, one of which terminates in what is known as the priest's house. Now to the ghosts. The top story of the central tower is a large, well-lighted apartment called the chapel having evidently served that purpose in times past. At one end is what is said to be in ob Obliette, now almost filled up. And I should add now that an Obliette is a secret dungeon with an opening only in the ceiling uh, in certain old castles. Occasionally in the evenings, people walking along the roads or in the fields see the windows of this chapel lighted up for a few seconds as if many lamps were suddenly brought into it. This is certainly not due to servants. From our experience, we can testify that it is the last place on earth that a domestic would enter after dark. It is also said that a treasure is buried somewhere in or around the castle. The legend runs that an ancestor was about to be taken to Dublin on a charge of rebellion, and fearing he would never return, made the best of the time left to him by burying somewhere a crock full of gold and jewels. Contrary to expectation, he did return, but his long confinement had turned his brain and he could never remember the spot where he had deposited his treasure years before. Some time ago, a lady, a Miss B, who was decidedly psychic, was invited to Kilman Castle in the hope that she would be able to locate the whereabouts of this treasure. In this respect, she failed, unfortunately, but gave nonetheless a curious example of her power. As she walked to the hall with her hostess, she suddenly laid her hand upon the bare stone wall and remarked, There is something uncanny here, but I don't know what it is. In that very spot, some time previously, two skeletons had been discovered walled up. The sequel to this is curious. Some time after, Miss B was either trying automatic writing or else was at a seance, we forget which, when a message came to her from the unseen, stating that the treasure at Kilman Castle was concealed in the chapel under the tessellated pavement near the altar. But the spirit was either a lying spirit or else a most impish one, for there is no trace of an altar, and it is impossible to say from the style of the room where it stood while the tessellated pavement, if it exists, is so covered with the debris of the former roof that it would be almost impossible to have it thoroughly cleared. There is as well a miscellaneous assortment of ghosts. A monk, with tonsure and cowl, walks in at one window of the priest's house and out at another. There is also a little old man, dressed in the antique garb of a green cutaway coat, knee breeches, and buckled shoes. He is sometimes accompanied by an old lady in similar old-fashioned costume. Another ghost has a penchant for lying on the bed beside, it lawf beside its lawful and earthly occupant. Nothing is seen, but a great weight is felt, and a consequent deep impression made on the bedclothes. The lady of the house states that she has had a number of letters from friends in which they relate the supernatural experiences they had while staying at the castle. And one of these, the writer, a gentleman, was awakened one night by an extraordinary feeling of intense cold at his heart. He then saw in front of him a tall female figure, clothed from head to foot in red, and with its right hand raised menacingly in the air, the light which illuminated the figure was from within. He lit a match, sprang out of bed, but the room was empty. He went back to bed and saw nothing more that night, except that several times the same cold feeling gripped his heart, though to the touch the flesh was quite warm. But of all the ghosts in that well-haunted house, the most unpleasant is that inexplicable thing that is usually called it. The lady of the house described to the present writer her personal experience of this phantom. High up round one side of the hall runs a gallery which connects with some of the bedrooms. One evening, she was in this gallery, leaning on the balustrade and looking down into the hall. Suddenly, she felt two hands laid on her shoulders. She turned round sharply and saw it standing close beside her. 
She described it as being human in shape and about four feet high. The eyes were like two black holes in the face. And the whole figure seemed as if it were made of gray cotton wool, while it was accompanied by a most appalling stench, such as would come from a decaying human body. The lady got a shock from which she did not recover for a long, long time. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Is that where the original it comes from? Yeah, yeah. So some Maybe. creepy, creepy uh, creature. A uh, couple things. Automatic writing is writing said to be produced. We've talked about it here before, but it's been a yeah, little while. It's been a really long time. I had a fan story about that. Yeah, they used to do it more in like the early 1900s, late 1800s, you know, more more fashionable, I guess, or people more into it. But it's writing said to be produced by a spiritual, uh, occult, or subconscious agency rather than by the conscious intention of the writer. Often referred to as a parlor game. Mm, yeah, parlor game. Yeah, you you let you be you open up your body to be a vessel mm -hmm. to be inhabited by something from the unseen, as he referred to it, and then that thing through you writes messages. I know. I I think it's such a cool idea. I and then if, it's, if it works, yeah. And then tessellated, uh, arranged in or having the appearance of a mosaic, checkered. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then uh, tonsure and cowl is like. The, the traditional monk's image, like like the tonsure is the shaving of the head of the crown only. Oh. So that monk haircut where you just shave the top of the head uh -huh. and leave the sides. And then the cowl is a, that hooded garment uh, worn by monks. So with the okay. hood and the long cloak, that's the cowl, tonsure and cowl. Balustrades, a railing, and then nom de plume. I like that one. I know that. That is uh, like a pseudonym. A pseudonym. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just a fancy word for pseudonym. I, I knew the balustrade because like a uh, baluster. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the occult review was a. I know. Is that a newspaper? It was a British illustrated monthly magazine, cool. published between 1905 and 1951, containing articles and correspondences by many notable occultists and authors. And I love how it was just like so openly accepted that they were studying mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. I know. I was thinking that too, and it does make me like you know we'll see what you know uh, listeners creeps and peepers. What do you think of these kind of old stories? Is it fun to have them like added for variety? And if you do think it is. What I'd like to do is start trying to track down. I mean, they won't be in digital form in all likelihood. Yeah. But try and track down through like used book dealers or whatever copies of these old periodicals from like the late 1800s, early 1900s that were all about the supernatural. Be fun. Because Maybe sure, if you guys like it. Yeah, if you like it. I mean, I'm sure there are stories in there you're not going to be able to find online anywhere. True. True, mm -hmm. true, true. Um, and then I'm not sure what the castle uh, is or where it is that he's talking about. I'm guessing it's Kilkenny Castle though. Kilkenny Castle, located a 90-minute drive south of Dublin, you could refer to it as like the center of Ireland, and it, it is said to be haunted by as many as 41 ghosts. Ooh. So I'm guessing that's the castle he was actually talking about. You've never been to Ireland, right? Mm -mm. Really want to go, though. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, okay, so I'll show a few covers now, uh, just for some illustrations. This first one, a cover uh, from just this year, from a new edition of True Ghost Stories, True Irish Ghost Stories. And that's just from this year, 2023? Mm-hmm, yep. Okay, okay. This next one, a uh, cover from another edition that will come out next year. You can buy it, but it's not out yet. And the, it's not the same stories over and over. It is. It is. Okay, it's just different yeah. covers. Yeah, different publishings. And then I'll explain that in one second. One more. This is a cover from 2006, and it cracks me up. They're asking 515 pounds for the paperback, 610 pounds for the hardcover. Holy Hades. And no one, no one should buy that because... Uh, there are all of these editions in recent years because it ran out, you know, because of how long ago it was, it was made. Yeah. It's a uh, public domain now, you know, like when this, when this book was, uh, you know, first published, it's been over a hundred years and uh -huh. that's, that's the rule. And then it goes into public domain where anybody can choose to publish the stories. Funny. And what's funny is a lot of these editions I was looking at will have like, you know, not to be reproduced in any form. Like they're trying to copyright. It. I'm like, you can't copyright it. It's a public domain work. Yeah. And um, you missed the window. Yeah, and and now they actually changed the law on that for uh, for the last like a couple decades ago. So for new written works, the copyright claim won't fall into public domain until seventy years after the death of the author. Oh boy! And I like that. So then it just gives like the family time to continue to monetize it. Mm -hmm. You know, well after their death. We should get going on writing books. <laughs> So, so our kids can, our, our grandkids can, you know. I do want to. I do want to write a horror book, so we'll see. Oh, man. Well, we'll see. We'll see how that shakes out. I mean, I'm here for it. I am yeah. here for it. I'll, I'll be working on other things. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. I got to gotta load you up with a new Layla I know, next I week. I know. I didn't grab one before, but I'm still liking the red one. Okay, well. And and then uh, Crochetla. Crochetla. I do love Crochetla. She's mm -hmm. so cute. Uh, don't put her face down. She does not care oh, for that. Oh, okay, okay. She can't see what's going on. 
She gets upset. There we go. Okay. Phew, thank you. Are right, you ready to go- come back to America and go to Florida? <laughs> I am. I All am. right. Settle in. Here we go. Okay. Hello, Creep Master and Princess Peeper. I've never shared this story with anyone, partially for fear of people being incredulous, partially because it creeps me out to just think about it, much less verbalize it. While everyone says it, I do promise you that these are 100% real happenings and they still give me full body chills, even as I write about this chapter of my own history. I was raised in a very stern Christian home. Uh, I was raised in very stern Christian homes where ghosts and supernatural were always shunned and not being real. I say homes because my parents divorced when I was little and I bounced around for almost 10 years. These occurrences all took place in St. Augustine, Florida in the early 90s. After my parents split up, my older sister, my mother, and myself relocated to St. Augustine to be closer to my grandparents. We were kids living in a pre-internet era and didn't know much about St. Augustine, any of the history of the area, or the myriad of supposed hauntings that are listed as being commonplace in that town. We were happy to be close to family and away from all the arguing, abuse, and domestic hell that was our life when my parents were married. One of the first things you do as a religious household in a new town is to find your new church. My mother decided we would attend church where my grandparents had been going for a couple of years, and my grandpa was also a deacon there. It was an old church that was located on the marshy banks of the San Sebastian River. The church property stretched from the paved road back to the river. From the road, it appeared as if there was just empty lots bordering the church on either side. There were very tall hedgerows that lined the church property, so you couldn't actually see the properties next to it once you were in the parking lot. Before and after church services, the kids would all play outside, sometimes for hours. There were large grass fields and plenty of trees along with a small playground. It was a good escape that we, as we found the services mostly boring, aside from the old guy who sat in the pew in front of us, He would turn off his hearing aids, apparently he didn't like the sermon either, and regularly farted loud enough (laughs) since he couldn't hear enough, which got laughs from us kids and subsequent stern looks from everyone else. (laughs) During one of our first visits to the church, we met Christy. She was definitely a little different. She always wore black, black dresses, black makeup, black chokers. Think goth before that was a thing. (laughs) She knew all the best hiding spots and also where they kept the juice for communion. Oftentimes, we were, when we were playing, Christy would randomly disappear for long stretches of time, and then she would show back up, walk to the rest of us kids casually, and just quietly hang out. One afternoon, three of us tried to sneak behind her and follow. She left the group and sauntered off towards the river. We stayed back and then followed her as she was walking down towards the marsh, approached the property line, and then we all caught a glimpse of her as she pushed into the hedgerow and it seemed to close around her. About 30 minutes later, we saw the leaves rustling and she pushed through into the daylight. Oh, hey, she said, surprised to see us. And we were just as surprised to see her, mainly because she was bleeding. Her face had several deep scratches on it with blood running down her cheek. Thoroughly freaked out, we started hurling questions at her. Acting nonchalant, Chrissy just replied, you guys, it's fine. It was just Sarah. I made her angry. We looked at one another confused. Who the heck is Sarah? Oh, she's just this girl that lives next door. And she pointed towards the hedges. Again, confused, we started talking all at once. Nobody lives next door. It's an empty lot. What are you talking about? She looked annoyed as she explained, there's a house over there and Sarah lives there. We play together all the time. She wanted me to go into her house and upstairs to her room, but I told her it freaked me out and she got upset, screamed, and then scratched me and told me to leave before she ran inside. Now we were all walking a line between fear and disbelief while debating between running back towards our parents or trying to figure out what the hell Christy was talking about. How could all this have happened in an empty lot? Was she just looking for attention? I guess we were creeps because we wanted to see what she was talking about. After some prodding, she agreed to introduce us to Sarah. We followed her back towards the marsh. Christy stopped and looked at us with dark, piercing eyes. Okay, listen, you can't tell anyone about this. Sarah lives there alone and she doesn't want anyone else to know she's by herself. I asked what everyone else was thinking. How old was she? Where was her family? Chrissy just shook her head. It doesn't matter. Let's go. She pushed the hedges and we reluctantly followed. And as we came through to the other side, the air felt colder. The sky felt darker and seemed so much more overcast than it had just a few moments earlier. There was a dilapidated two-story house with its front door standing open, old metal toys sitting on the deteriorating porch. The walkway to the porch had an old hand mirror in the middle of it with shattered glass lying around it. 
the grass was long neglected, overgrown in the yard, three cars sitting on flat tires that were rusting away while parked in a circular driveway, and trees that looked dead with thin, pointy branches arched towards the sky. I looked down the driveway towards where the road should be, but it wasn't visible. The property was overgrown and reclaimed by nature and time. It looked, at, it looked as if a family had lived there and then one day just disappeared. As we were walking to the scenery, dumbfounded that there was actually a house here that none of us even knew existed, Christy suddenly exclaimed, Sarah, it's me. I'm going to come talk to you for a minute. She turns towards us, explains that she's going to let Sarah know we want to meet her. She walks the 80 or 90 feet up the porch without hesitation, walks up the porch step, and stands in front of an open door. Christy starts talking to someone. We're all confused and exchanged questioning glances as there is nobody in our sight. She had this back and forth conversation for a few minutes with no one. The wind is blowing through the dead tree limbs, leaves rustling across the grass. The old house sounds like it's settling. Her words sound almost like she's pleading and trying to convince someone to talk to her friends. And at this point, I'm convinced she's just messing with us. And I start to get irritated. Then Christy hangs her head down, says okay, and turns towards us looking dejected as she starts to walk towards the stairs of the porch. Sarah doesn't want to meet you. She said she can't leave the house and she doesn't want you guys in her room. She was coming down the steps and I loudly yelled back, yeah, okay. Well, thanks anyways. Nice to meet you, Sarah, in a sarcastic voice. <laughs> no sooner had the words exited my mouth that the front door slammed shut. We didn't need to speak. We all just ran as fast as we could and we got to the hedges with Christy leading the way. She stopped and turned back to look at the house. She looked sad and then waved before turning away into the hedges. We looked back at the house and there, standing in the second story window was a young girl, maybe 10 or 11. Sarah was real and she looked disappointed. And then her expression changed to something somewhere between annoyed and angry. And then she disappeared. We just about knocked each other down trying to get through those damn hedges. And we never talked about it again. And, every, and we never went back through the hedges. This phase of my life was full of changes. My mother was struggling, struggling financially and we moved around a lot. We lived in seven homes in five years. They were always in very low income areas, single wide trailers, duplexes, one double wide in an especially bad part of town where we would witness drug dealings in broad daylight. Our house was even targeted for attempted break-ins regularly, even though we were home. And then one day we moved into an actual house. It was very old, built in the 1900s, original architecture, beautiful woodwork everywhere, and included the creaking floors and settling sounds and all the other fun noises that come with an old house. It wasn't the best neighborhood, but it wasn't terrible either. Most of the houses around us were very old on a quiet street. Being from a broke family, we didn't own video games that you could play on the TV, and so we basically lived outside. Our imaginations were endless, and we were always exploring and finding new ways to get into trouble. It didn't take long before we were playing hide-and-go-seek and discovered some marble gravestones that were in the backyard, partially buried and covered by bushes growing under an old pecan tree. The tombstones had names and dates of death, but no other information. Obviously, this freaked us out. Who buries people in their backyard? We asked our mom, and she said it was probably just pets with people's names or somebody's version of a memorial. But they were spaced like they were supposed to be in a cemetery, and the ground was slightly raised in front of each stone and they were old, very old. The marble was chipping and cracked in places with dates of death around the turn of the century. Over the year or so that we lived there, we had many odd occurrences. Shadows that moved through the house, unexplained noises, odd smells that would come and go. The phone would ring at all hours of the day and the night. We would answer it, but most of the time no one was there. And then one night when our mother wasn't home, I answered the phone and just heard a soft crackling sound. I kept saying hello as my sister asked me who was on the phone. I was just about to hang up when without warning, I heard what sounded like an old woman's voice shriek, get out, and then the line went dead. I called my aunt who lived nearby and she came to stay with us until my mom came home from work. Clearly, this was terrifying. My mom would tell us it was fine, just a prank call or something, but we never believed her. We would hear all kinds of knocks on the front door and taps on the living room windows, but of course, no one was ever there when we checked. My mom always dismissed it saying, it was nothing, don't worry about it. And as creepy as our house could be at some times, it was nothing compared to the house next door. It sat on the lot immediately next to us, a very old house looking to be hundreds of years old, and it appeared as if no one had lived there in more than 50 years. Through the hazy window panes, at times the light hit it just right and you could see that there was still furniture in the house, including an old rocking chair and a couple of chairs on the porch with cobwebs hanging from them. 
as if someone just left one day and never returned. The fences were locked and the yard was overgrown. No one ever came or went. We then started to notice that sometimes there was an old woman standing out in front of the house on the sidewalk. She never spoke. She had on a dark old cloak with a hood, which was weird because who the hell wears a cloak? And (laughs) most of the year, Florida is hot as hell. And I don't know what else to call it besides a cloak. It wasn't a jacket. It wasn't a dress. It wasn't even a hooded sweater. Just a garment like you would see from an old movie or history book that wrapped around her shoulders and tied in front under the under her chin and had a hood. A few times when my mom wasn't home, we would notice her standing in front of our house, staring. We assumed she was the elderly mother of a neighbor. And when we mentioned it to our mom, she said that the Taurus family must have had their aging parents move in with them. My family had a lot of pets, and my mother would jokingly refer to us as the zoo. I'd like to think we were more of a circus. My mom had a a terrarium with six gerbils in it that she kept in the living room. My sister had two large rabbits that were kept on the front porch in a cage, and occasionally we would let them play in the yard. There was a corn snake named Red in an enclosure in our kitchen and a black cat named Lucky that was always getting into mischief, and we had a large Doberman named Sadie. Not long after living there, we started noticing weird things happening with our pets. One day after my mom got home from work, we heard her exclaim from her bedroom, Oh my God! And my sister and I ran to the room to see what was going on. My mom standing there with her hands over her mouth staring at the cage, all the gerbils in it dead. Uh. There weren't any visible injuries and we couldn't explain it. We quickly learned that our dog Sadie hated the house next door. Anytime we would walk her down the sidewalk in front of that house, she would lower her shoulders, hair standing up on the back of her neck, and she would start staring at the house, quietly growling until we passed it. As we walked by that old house one evening, we noticed the old woman was standing outside next to the fence. Sadie was growling louder than usual, and my sister said, sorry, our dog doesn't like this house. And the old woman never moved, never looked up, (laughs) but quietly under her breath, she said, well... The house doesn't like Sadie either. We were a bit freaked out and walked away very quickly, wondering how the woman had even known our dog's name. A couple days later on our walk, my sister and I decided to stop in front of that creepy house and try to see if we noticed anything happening. My sister, always a smart ass, yelled out, Hello, ghosts, can you hear me? And I don't know if she's a creep or an idiot, but that's a riddle for another day. Sadie, however, began to bark and we saw movement in the house. A bit of motion moving across the front windows caught our attention. It looked like a person walking or rather the shadow of a person walking. The amount of light in the house changed and shadows began shifting through the house in a way that almost looked as if the sun were setting quickly, but it was still high in the sky. I immediately felt cold on my skin, got head to toe chills and felt like something bad was happening. I didn't understand it enough then, but I now understand it was like a dark energy and a heaviness had descended upon us like a thick fog. The rocking chair inside the front window began to rock, first slowly. My sister and I looked at each other to confirm silently that we both were actually seeing this. And then the chair rocked faster, almost aggressively rocking. We exchanged freaked out glances and as we were watching the chair, it just suddenly stopped. Then we heard, heavy footsteps moving across the freaking the creaking front porch cobwebs on the front porch drifted in the breeze as if someone or something had just walked past it except we couldn't see anyone we ran all the way home and never looked back over the next few weeks we started to notice that anytime we let sadie out into the yard she would stay away from the fence line nearest that old house if we would go near that side of the yard to play she would look at us and then look past us growling never come closer As my sister and I sat on the front porch on a summer afternoon, we heard someone talking softly. We peered over the railing of our screened front porch and saw the old woman staring at Sadie, one arm raised with a crooked finger pointing at our dog as she appeared to be muttering something in some other language. Sadie was cowering under a bush and looked terrified. Needing to be the tough guy, or as much as one could be as a pudgy 11-year-old, I yelled, (laughs) hey, and her head turned towards me. Dark eyes that looked hollow and black underneath the hood of her cloak met mine, and I was come overcome with pure fear. I dropped down behind the wall of the porch to hide. My sister peeked out a minute later, and she didn't see anything. The lady was gone. I joined her, and she was right. No one was there, and we couldn't see the old woman anywhere. We told my mother about this incident when she got home that night, and she was so upset that this neighbor was scaring us. She went to all of the neighbors and began asking whose elderly mother was walking around the neighborhood. She wanted to get to the bottom of it just to relay that she was spooking us kids and could she maybe walk in some other direction. She came home looking confused. None of the neighbors knew what she was talking about. No one had an elderly mother or family member currently living with them. And that was maybe worse, that no one had ever seen this old lady. 
A few days after all this happened, we came home from school and stood in the yard calling for Sadie. She always ran to greet us, but she didn't come this time. We put our backpacks down on the porch and called for her again, whistling for her to come. As we asked our mom where the dog was, she just shrugged and said she had left Sadie out into the yard earlier in the day. We went outside looking all over, and then we found her. She was lying in the grass, dead. She was right next to the fence closest to that creepy old house. The ground was scratched up in front of her, appearing as if she had been clawing, trying to get away from something that was holding her back. She had no medical history, no visible wounds, and she was only two years old. We took her to the vet and they thought maybe she had been poisoned, but the toxicology reports they ran didn't show anything. They had no answers for us. And then two weeks later, we came home from the grocery store. My sister went out to give the rabbits treats, but a few minutes later came in upset, saying she couldn't find them. My mom, frustrated, told her to go look again, but my sister insisted that they weren't in the cages and they weren't on the porch. Just like the search for Sadie, we all went outside to look and my mom found them. They were under the pecan tree in the back corner of the yard, lying facing each other just in front of the old marble gravestones, both of them dead, what appeared to be like broken necks. One night, around 2 a.m., I was awakened by a sense of dread. Lucky, our black cat was sitting on my bed, staring at me. She made a low, guttural moan and then just stared at me. While I sat up trying to figure out what the hell was going on, my sister burst into my room and started frantically whispering to me that she needed help. I asked her what was happening and she said that the house was on fire. I looked at her with disbelief. What? She exclaimed, my bedroom is on fire. I told her she needed to go wake up our parents and let them know what was going on. But she wouldn't. She was afraid of our stepdad, and so I had had enough. I ran out of my room, looked towards the back of the house where her room was located, and saw a heavy smoke in the glow of flames. I then ran to my parents' room, kicked the door open, shouted that the house was on fire. I ran back, called 911, and made sure everyone was awake and getting out of the house. The fire department came and was able to put the fire out quickly before it did too much structural damage. The fire marshal said it looked as if someone had somehow taken my sister's bedroom lamp and then removed the lampshade, turned it on, and laid it on its side on her bed on the bare bulb igniting her pillow, which started the fire, which started the room on fire. As we stood in the front yard, exhausted and processing that our house could have easily been burnt to the ground, I felt a cold chill come over me. I noticed my sister was staring at something behind me and I turned around to look. All the firemen, all the police, and the small crowd of neighbors had gathered around us in the commotion. But there, at the back of the crowd, was the old woman in the Mm. cloak. She was standing behind everyone in the shadow of an oak tree where the lights slightly illuminated her face and she was pointing at my sister. I grabbed at my mother's robe and pointed. She looked and saw the old woman as well. I don't know if it was the stress of the situation or that she finally believed us about the old woman, but my mom grabbed my hand and we marched over to a policeman who she promptly asked if he could go speak to the woman under the oak tree because she had been frightening us kids. The cop asked who she was talking about, and as my mother pointed, we realized the reason for his confusion. No one was standing there. My mom frantically looked up and down the street and to no avail. The woman was gone. My mother decided after this night that she had had enough with the weird occurrences and we moved into a single wide trailer across town. It was a dump and it was in a crappy neighborhood. But we didn't have any more animals die mysteriously. The house didn't catch on fire and we never saw the old woman ever again. Fast forward a bit, I moved away in 1996, leaving at a very young age due to some difficult family situations. And I didn't go back to St. Augustine for almost 20 years. And then in 2015, now having kids of my own, I figured it had been long enough and maybe we should go for a vacation. I told them some of the history of the city and they were excited for our trip. When we first got to town, I was driving down the road following my GPS when all of a sudden, I felt very drawn to a side street. It was a familiar feeling, like nostalgia or deja vu. I turned left, ignoring the GPS. My kids immediately asked where we were going as the GPS protested my decisions. I replied, I don't really know yet but I've been here before. And we drove down the road, and as I was making turns on instinct, I saw it. We were right in front of my old house. We'd only lived there for a year when I was a kid, and more than 20 years earlier, uh, we'd only lived there for a year, more than 20 years earlier, and yet somehow I had navigated myself right to it. I told my kids that this was my old house, and they were commenting that it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter made a little noise from the back and said, it's neat and all, but can we go now? That old house is scary. And it wasn't until then that I realized that damn creepy house was still there. I crept the car forward to get a better look. It had been more than 20 years, and yet somehow it was untouched and oblivious to the passage of time. 
The yard, still overgrown. The gates were still locked. The rocking chair still slightly visible through the hazy and now cracked front windows. The cobweb-covered furniture still on the decaying porch. The rocking chair started softly rocking inside the front window, and I felt a familiar chill come all over me. Yep, we can go, honey. And we left. That's a great story. Great story. So many things. Yeah, that's one of my favorite fan stories in a while. Awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. That is, uh... I always wonder what, like, okay, with a house like that, who the hell owns it, right? Because, like, yeah. no, no one's living there. No one has been living there for a long, long time. But it hasn't just fallen into foreclosure because if the bank took it over, the bank would sell it. Right. Like, there'd be some kind of auction or something. Yeah. So, somebody, someone has owned that place for decades. Right. And just not rented it out, not renovated it, just is maybe afraid of it. But then why would they be afraid to sell it? Or maybe, like, they know that it's dangerous and they don't want yeah. someone to live there. Those are all possibilities. It's also possible that it was like left to a distant family member in a will somewhere and they just never figured it out. They never Hmm. like, you know, actually claimed it. Like it's just- Somebody's got to pay property taxes. True. But maybe somebody is like just paying it and they're like, oh, whatever. It's not like worth my time. I don't know. Maybe the estate, there could, it could be part of an estate and there's enough money in the estate to continue to pay for. And then at some point that money will run out and then- the bank will take it. Or maybe they're sitting on it, you know, in the hopes that like that area will develop differently in the future and they'll make a bunch of money. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, what a malevolent entity where it's like, um, we haven't come across one of those in a fan story where, where it's killing things. Killing animals, like scaring the kids, this like cloaked th- old lady. I thought her sister might die. for when the, when the thing pointed at her sister, that yeah. thing, I was like, I, I, I was waiting for the story to turn into like, you know, uh, six months later, mm-hmm. uh, my sister didn't wake up from her sleep or something uh, like that. Yeah. The... The fire starting is such a specific, like, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking about like we have bedside lamps as I'm sure many people do. And it's like to take the lampshade off and then lie it down on the bed, like just inches from your face. That's insane. Yeah. Because a kid wouldn't do that. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like that's like, no, that's a specifically torturous way to start a fire. (laughs) Yeah, that's intense. Uh, The mom, good job on the mom not being a Darren and just truly just getting the fuck out. She She ain't no Donna. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, no, Donna. Yeah, uh, sounds like she left it, you know, a considerable financial detriment to herself. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like money has always been tight mm-hmm. and challenging, and she just was like, this is not safe. And Man, so- good for her. That's hard. That's a yeah. really hard choice to make. Man, but I mean, even take out, like, the paranormal. Mm-hmm. You know, like, if, if, you know, if you live somewhere, you, you know, you got two little kids, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, your two-year-old healthy dog- is just like they can't figure out what happened. It looks like it's been poisoned, but the toxicology report says no. And then that followed by the rabbits with the broken necks. I know. Ugh. That alone. And the dead gerbils. Oh, yeah. That's right. Before the dog with the dead gerbils, those things, boom, boom, boom. I have full body chills right now. I mean, just for safety, it's Blech. like, no, we're getting, because it's either like the paranormal mm-hmm. or some maniac. Exactly. Who's targeting either way, the family. you got to get out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, scary. Yeah, yeah, very scary. And even before that, just like proving how haunted that area is, the weird encounter with that Sarah girl, like living in this yeah. house. I mean, obviously, in my mind, it's very obvious that Sarah is a paranormal entity, that there's not actually a 10 or 11-year-old girl living in a house by herself. Right. Oh, right, right, right. And that that, that uh, entity was violent. Scratched the little girl, like her face, right? At the yeah, start like of the she story. got mad. I'm just like, mm-hmm. yeah, I was like, whoo. Yeah, and that whole door slam when they like mocked it. Uh huh. And then immediately the door slams and then seat it in the window. Yeah. There's a lot of shit going on in this story. Yeah. And I do have three photos of the creepy house uh, that was the house oh. next to the house that um, our fan lived in. So okay. we can pull it up. Oh so, my God. Yeah. Just like it does look like it's being like reclaimed by like the swamp. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's just being eaten. So overgrown. Who? So why, over- why won't they sell that? That's so weird. Like, why would you fucking just sit on that house? Yeah. Let's look at the next one, Logan. Because also it's like, who wants to buy a house next to that? Right. Like if I'm the neighbor, even just like, I'm like, all right, listen, if no one's going to do anything, I'm going to do something about this. Yeah, like, could, you, could you buy it super cheap and bulldoze it? Yeah. Or just like, I'm going to at least like cut it down. And then we have one more photo. I mean, it's just like different angles of the same house over yeah. and over. But but yeah, that is really overgrown. Uh-huh. And just falling apart. Yeah. The roof is still there. I mean, it hasn't like, you know, it might be. It hasn't collapsed yet. Savable. I don't know where St. Augustine is on a map. So I'm in my mind, I was like- it's Way down in Southern Florida, I think. It's the oldest- So could a hurricane take it? Is it a I coastal think so. town? I think it is. Well, actually, I mean, I don't no. want to wish it on a, a terrible it hurricane on other people, but I feel like that might be the way that it 
gets obliterated. St. Augustine. Um, man, Florida. Oh, there's so many like St. Augustine school, library, <laughs> like all these things. But I, I want to say it's like the oldest city. Is it the oldest city in America? Yeah, it lays claim to being the oldest city in the U.S. Wow, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that does sound familiar. Maybe you told me that once before. Oh, oh, it's actually not where I thought it was, though. It's it's way up north uh, oh. it's by Jacksonville. So oh, it's, oh. So it is along the coast. It's in between Daytona Beach and Jacksonville. But probably not going to get obliterated by a hurricane. I mean, maybe. It is on the coast there. Mm-hmm. Further north, I feel like that area tends to get skipped a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you But like the storm slows oftentimes because it's coming mm-hmm. up from the south as opposed to coming in from That's the That's true. That's true. You don't hear about a lot of like, you know, or I can't think of a lot of like stories of Jacksonville getting like bombarded. Now, I'm sure that they get hammered with like uh, residual rains and all that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. And I guess it's on the wrong side. It's like if it was on the west side mm-hmm. of Florida, like with, you know, towards New Orleans and mm-hmm. stuff. It's like that's where hurricanes, you know, so maybe on that east side, yeah. they don't get hit. I don't think they do dare as much. I, dare I say hurricane season has been quite quiet this year. I yeah. Know. Knock on, knock on this wood here. Knock, knock on wood. <laughs> Come on, New Orleans. Turn it around. Yeah. Ah, well, good. Well, good story. And that was anonymous, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whoever sent that, thank you. Yes. And then I have one more story for you. Oh, that's right. Oh my gosh, that was like a long one. That's right. I great, know. great. Another one. Okay, yeah, awesome, yeah, yeah, awesome, yeah. awesome. And then this story takes us to India. Oh, that's right. The the curse. Yes. And then I just want to say that um, right off the rip, the submitter just says like, English is not her first language. So okay. there, some of the words, I didn't want to change it because I feel like it loses something. Yeah. But, you know, if you're like, wait a second, that doesn't sound quite how I would say mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Just roll with it. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. India, great tradition of uh, horror lore. Mm-hmm. This is the story of a demonic possession that was initiated by performing black magic and a haunting that continued for over a decade. Before Dan seeks validation of any of the content I present below, let me say that this story has been witnessed and corroborated by multiple people, including my dad. In 1970, a family living in a small village was filled with happiness that they had found a match for their second daughter. The bride's father, an Orthodox priest, mother, her brother, and two sisters were thrilled about this match. Everyone was talking about the marriage, except for the bride's grandfather who lived with them. The grandfather was also an Orthodox priest, and he believed in astrology. He said that his granddaughter's horoscope did not really match with the bridegroom's horoscope, and he did not approve of of this match or marriage. Also, he was skeptical about the groom's family as they were not from the same town. The bridegroom was handsome, had a well-paid job, was financially stable, and was as religious as the bride's family. All these made him an attractive husband material. The husband's mom was keen on getting her daughter married to him. Though the grandfather disapproved of the match, the parents proceeded with getting their daughter married. Everyone and everything was fine until a few months after the marriage, after which all the happiness turned into sorrow for this family. Their beloved daughter developed some complications, or at least that is what was said to them when she was dropped off at her parents' place by her husband. They were told that she had began acting restless and agitated while she was with her husband, and her husband thought that it must be because she missed her parents and her family. So everyone decided that it was best for her to stay at her parents' house for a few weeks. At her parents' place, she acted totally normal. She did not display any signs of being agitated or restless. After a week, the husband decided to pay a visit to his wife over the weekend. He finished work early on a Friday and got on the bus to visit his wife. When he got down from the bus and started walking towards his in-law's house, his wife began acting strange. She would instantly go into sleep or a trance mode and would not move until her husband was gone. Without knowing what is wrong with his wife, the husband decided to go back to his town for work and would come back again the next weekend. As soon as he boarded the bus to go back to his town, his wife was absolutely fine. She woke up and did not remember a thing that had happened, and she had no recollection of going into a trance and not waking up for hours and and that her husband had visited. This happened every time he came to see her. Not knowing what was wrong with their daughter, her parents decided to seek medical help. They took her to multiple doctors who were at the top of their field and ran several tests on her to find out if she had a disease or a mental illness. Every test came back normal, and the doctors found no abnormalities in her physical or mental health. Medically, she was perfectly fine. And this really upset her parents and her family. Not knowing what was wrong with their daughter was very painful for them. Things only escalated from here for their beloved daughter. 
On a fine evening, they saw their daughter crying and screaming in pain. Not knowing what was wrong with her, her family rushed to her room only to find her rolling on the floor, screaming in pain. Her family would witness scars appearing all over her body and bleeding coming from those scars. She would cry out in pain, rolling all over the floor, yelling for it to stop. Her family did not understand why she was being tormented like this and more so who or what was doing this to her. This happened several times, all at random days and times. In 1970, there were no telecommunications, no internet, and the main mode of communication was through letters or telegram. A few weeks after the cruel episodes, the girl's family received a letter from the husband's family that they had been performing religious prayers for the sake of the girl so she could recover from her illness and return to her husband's place as soon as possible. The girl's family then realized that the dates and times of scars that appeared on their daughter's body and the dates and times of the religious prayers performed by her in-laws were the same. The girl's family was upset and angry that all of the so-called prayers were actually tormenting their daughter, and they wrote a stern reply to their son-in-law to stop all prayers so their daughter wouldn't be tortured by the invisible elements. All of this led to the belief that this was all this led to the belief that what was going on with their daughter was not medical, but rather paranormal. The more they thought about it, the more it became clear that some dark entity had attached itself to their daughter to torment her body and soul. Her parents tried to take their daughter to religious places, which were believed to ward off spirits and paranormal entities. They saw psychics and paranormal investigators. The mother and daughter were asked to perform a spiritual ritual for 48 days by a psychic. The, the ritual included taking a bath every day in holy water, visiting places of prayer, and praying every day. During this ritual, the girl was believed to be possessed by something, started vomiting every single day. The contents of her vomit alarmed and shocked her family. She would vomit long human hairs, sometimes uh. as long as three feet long. This scared everyone around her, and they decided to stop performing the ritual. Her family was definitely not prepared for what was to come next. Their lovely daughter stopped eating food. She would not consume even water. She did not eat anything for several months, yet showed no signs of being weak or hungry. Though she had no appetite for food or water, she managed to maintain all of her household chores. She never seemed tired or weak. Her mother was so shaken and depressed by what had come of her daughter. She could not believe that she had not consumed a single drop of water in months, and yet her daughter was energetic, strong. Her family had said enough was enough and started investigating the reasons for why their daughter had become like this. They contacted a, repu a, rep a reputable paranormal investigator who informed them that dark black magic had been performed on their daughter. The investigator said that a family friend of the groom's had wanted their daughter to be married to the groom. But when they found out that the groom's mm. family had found a tall, beautiful girl from another town, they were filled with agony and hatred towards his new bride. They, they took all measures to ruin the bride's life so she couldn't live a happy life, a life they felt was not hers but was meant to be someone else's. The paranormal investigator said that a curse was put upon their daughter using ashes and then was dissolved into the sea so no one could locate it to reverse the curse. This meant there was no way out for their daughter. The mother felt very bad since their beautiful daughter's fate was changed by people whom they didn't even know had existed. On a bright summer afternoon, the mother and the sister of the girl finished eating their lunch and went out to their front porch to have afternoon tea. A few minutes later, the mother began to smell smoke and rushed inside the house to find their daughter was on fire. What? The smoke and flames were as tall as 12 feet and at the top of the flames stood the face of a demon with fangs and a bright smile. Within minutes, the demon disappeared, taking their daughter's body and soul with it. What the hell? Isn't that insane? burned a lot, spontaneous combustion just like went up like a candle mm -hmm. all some curse because like some other family and some other village it is like so crazy to think about how important status like that is in other cultures like they're still trying to like you know they're they're still arranged marriages and they're trying yeah, to like modernize more yeah yeah they're trying to like build their family legacy oh, right I see. you yeah, know they're yeah, trying yeah, yeah, to yeah. like uh move up in the world it's like they don't have the same sort of capabilities that we do to like you know be entrepreneurs and you know change their the course of their family's history yeah it reminds me of like medieval europe and stuff where it's like they would arrange marriages with, between nobles mm -hmm. to strengthen different houses yeah and then it was like you know these dowries and yeah yeah, yeah. such a 
very different way to live. Um, uh huh. It made sense then. Like, I mean, like obviously we can look back at it and be like, what a nightmare, you know, yeah, to be married yeah. off to someone that you don't love or, you know, you don't care for, mm -hmm. or, you know, you don't get to pursue love on your own, but, but it makes sense. I mean, it's like, you yeah, know, financially you you're trying to secure the estate for the family. Yeah. Keep yourself safe. Should there be war or famine? Right. Which was, you know, ever present back then. Mm hmm. That family love, like, okay, you know, going with the suspension of disbelief that curses yeah, 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 we know. are real and that you could, like, you know, place a curse. Uh, what pieces of shit I know. To, to, like, curse this poor girl? It's like, okay, yeah, like, uh, you you wanted your daughter to... Tough shit. I know, It, it so didn't sad? happen. You're a monster to then, like, put that on this person and have them actually die because of it because you're mad that your family financial situation is like, that's not her fault. I know. And then I was thinking about the bridegroom and, like, how terrible he must feel oh, in his yeah. family because also they didn't do anything, you right. know? And, it's, and it seemed like he... I mean, he came to see his wife, like, the family was praying, so it seems like, you know, they cared for this girl... Ugh. You, you got to move away if you're that guy because then, like, you'd be so worried about the next person you were to marry. I know. Or you just have to marry that girl and then deal with her crazy family. Or just kill her entire family. Oh, that seems aggressive. <laughs> well, they're monsters. I know, but. They're these cur curse, uh, curse makers. Okay, but yes, but also then there is just, like, the desperation. I mm -hmm. do, like, if I can just be human and just think, like, you know, sometimes in moments of desperation— for advancement, for like, I don't know, whatever mm -hmm. it is like to like make your life better. You know, you do crazy things and hopefully they just regretted it. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I know. There's 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 doing crazy things, but then there's uh, cursing someone to the point that they burn themselves. Fuck those people. <sighs> Fuck I that know. entire family. I, I, I'm trying to have some, some sympathy. I don't. I know. I, I'm I, softer I, than you. I, I hope the person who put that curse, I hope they died a horrible death. Hey, hey, hey. Mm -hmm. Eat you out. Do you want to perform a curse on them? I do. If I knew how to do curses. I also hope this doesn't get back to them so they don't curse me. Well, they might. <laughs> well, if I suddenly catch on fire and there's a demon above in the flames above me, I guess we know what happened. Or that's just you. Or that was yeah, my, my actual spirit being released. Yeah. And then everybody should be nervous. <laughs> or how exciting that you've been listening to a show that's been uh, you hosted, know, by, a demon hosted dude? by an actual demon dude. Mm -hmm. That's pretty mm -hmm. exciting. I'd be worried about my mental health. <laughs> yeah, you married a demon. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me? <laughs> What's wrong with my picker? <laughs> Do you want to, uh, that was great. Those were two great stories. Awesome. Glad you enjoyed them. I did. Do you want to thank Annabelle's first or me? Yeah, I can go first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks to the following Annabelle's for supporting us on Patreon. And we will announce the November uh, donation uh, in the coming weeks. We're just trying to get out the info about the giving tree right now. Yeah. Uh, okay. So thank you to these Annabelle's. Uh, Day of Rain. It's Dwayne. D A Y. It's Dwayne. D A Y A R A N E. D Ray. <laughs> Dorain. Day Day Arain. Day Arain. Day Arain. Day Arainy. I don't know. You Diablo. can tell me. Definitely. Abby Singleton. Charles Daly. It's pronounced Chuck. Amy Kern. Bunny Crazy Fire. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> You're the demon. Uh, Kip Green. Crystal. Jacob Cressman, Shannon Campbell, and Michael Esparza. Okay. Thank you, uh, Annabelle's. And then I would also like to thank the following Annabelle's. Melissa Wasson, Mariah Choppett, uh, Rocky Davis, um, Tonisha Sims, or Tonisha Sims, Carletta Rodriguez, Terry Tuznik, Arissa Code Coder. I, I have no idea. K-O-J-D-E-R. I don't know what K O J D E R where that name comes from. K O J Kozder Co Kozder Co Kozder um, Amanda Chavez fucking nailed it. Uh, McLovin. I think it's Chavez. No, nope. you know I think you got it wrong. No, nope, Chavez. Uh, and then <laughs> and then Fifi Ween Crocheter. I I love that one. I wanted to give it to you. <laughs> That's so random. That's fantastic. Oh, Fifi Ween Crocheter. I'm assuming it's like she or he crochets weans. Well, we have like a crocheted wiener around here somewhere. I'm like, oh, did you send that? <laughs> uh, okay. A uh, couple of spoopy shout outs. Yeah. To Alexandra from Aaron. Happy 30th birthday. I love you. To Daniel from your wife, Raylan, and your daughter, Morgan. Happy birthday. We're so proud of you. To Jordan, a.k.a. It's an avo. <laughs> Wait. To Jordan, a.k.a. It's an avocado from Casey, a.k.a. Double Clutch. I don't know what these nicknames are about, but I'm 
certain there is a story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love you, bitch. Miss getting drunk and playing games with you. Also, fuck you. It's called a handle, not a half gallon, which I would contest. Ah. I, had, I had never heard the term handle. Like, oh, a handle of this. I'm like, I have. That's grew up with the term handle. I did not. And I found, I learned that in college from one of my roommates, Jules, who was from Minnesota. And then I was like, oh, maybe it's like a thing there. And then people around here say it. Mm-hmm. So... I'm going to go with it's a half gallon. Thank you very much. (laughs) I used to say handle quite a bit, but I don't anymore. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) (sighs) To Miranda from James, happy 27th birthday to my little witch. Nice. Nice. Uh, That's our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. And you can continue to email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith for editing, publishing today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. To book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Uh, I found today's story, so thanks to priest John D. Seymour <laughs> for collecting those tales so long ago. Thank you, Father John. F- Father John found those stories. Father uh, John Misty. <laughs> uh, we're on YouTube if you want to watch the show. We're on Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes uh, at Scared to Death Podcast. And we do more than that on the Instagram and Facebook. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death. Mad Magic Productions. La la la. La 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 la.